From the earliest advancements of humanity, man has desired to leave behind a lasting and awe-inspiring legacy. From the great pyramids of Giza to the forts of the Aztec, we find sacred and remarkable structures created for protection, but also for elegance and to show dominance. As our desires as men advanced, so did our ability to create. When once we desired to raise buildings for defense, we were now creating for opulence. As travel expanded, the old world cultures began to lend and steal ideas from one another, leading to a mishmash of similarly styled structures worldwide. Alongside these master classes of construction, we usually can denote a marked advancement in the fine arts of these areas as well. Today, we will discuss what I think is the most major discovery of the 1700s as it relates to art and the bigger picture of the world. And that is the discovery, creation, and isolation of Prussian blue. So you're probably asking yourself, how can the creation of a simple color be so important to the history of the world? But if you stick with me, I promise you, I will break this down for you in a way that it will almost be impossible to deny just how important this discovery was. But first, let me start in the beginning. And in the beginning, we'll call it Egypt. You have the desire around the world, but especially in Egypt, to create with the color blue. Now, blue at the time could only be derived from grinding down very expensive minerals and stones like lapis lazuli and other rare gems. And they weren't bountiful enough in the world for them to be able to find these stones and grind them down to create blue pigment. So a quote unquote secret process was developed by the Egyptians. And from this secret process stemmed the color Egyptian blue. Now, if you look throughout your history books and the such, you'll discover that Egyptian blue basically gave Egypt a second Renaissance period. It made Egypt the central hub for art trade in the world. And it basically had all of the leaders and artists of the world clamoring to Egypt to get their hands on some of this Egyptian blue dye. Um, before this time, it said that basically blue was not being used in paintings and artwork and constructions because they simply did not have enough of the minerals to create it. But once this quote unquote secret process was developed in Egypt, we now had a new color that was being used everywhere. And this color was referred to as Egyptian blue. Now, as the narrative goes, uh, Multiple millennia went on with the success and use of Egyptian colors, including Egyptian blue, and it became a mainstay all around the world, especially in Rome and in Roman artwork. However, with the fall of Rome and the fall of Egypt, we lost the ability to create Egyptian blue. From the time it was used onward, no one was able to recreate the process to create this perfect uh, blue color. So basically when the Romans fell and when that culture fell, the narrative says we lost all ability again to use blue or pure blue, Egyptian blue in our artwork and in our paintings. What I find to be fascinating about that is during the dark ages that would follow and the middle ages, we have no use of Egyptian blue. So dark ages um, can be categorized not by their artwork. Yet if you focus on the artwork during the dark ages, you'll find that there's really no use of color because we lost the ability to create these colors. And I just find that to be very interesting. But I digress. Now, we have almost 1,000 years, they say, that would pass before another artist, creator, inventor would stumble upon the ability to create a pure blue color. However, this person was not a famous scientist. He was not a man of renown, and he was not looking to create the color blue. But I will just give you a little bit of the narrative that we're given about this discovery and you can tell me what you think about it in the comments below as the narrative goes 
Johann Jacob Diesbach was a small time paint creator in Prussia in 1706. And while he was looking to create a form of red paint, he accidentally mixed some blood in with the paint and somehow to his amazement this created a perfect blue color now he tried again with the same process and added a little blood and again created this perfect blue color so being a man from prussia they decided to name this color Prussian blue. And that is the narrative that we're given officially for how Prussian blue was discovered. And Prussian blue in itself is the purest form of blue that exists in the world. And why do I say it's the purest form of blue? I will get into that, but to put it in simplest terms, it cannot be seen on computer screens in its pure form because if it's electrified, it disappears. So I'll say that again, because it's 100% fact that Prussian blue cannot be depicted on electronic devices, because if you add electricity to the color of Prussian blue, it becomes so intense that our eyes can no longer see it and it becomes invisible. So within a few years of this Prussian blue being developed, we have its use in artwork and paintings and the such around the world. And I will try and include a few of those artworks here. As I just went over, you're not going to be able to get a full grasp of the color of Prussian blue simply because it cannot be displayed on art devices. And I want to talk about this color a little bit further as far as its importance goes within the world. Seeing as Prussia at this time basically converted everything about themselves into incorporating this Prussian blue color meaning their flag and the thing I want to focus on is their uniforms their military garb per se uh, it was all changed to this Prussian blue color so throughout history when you look at different photographs paintings things of the such and you see troops that are in a bright blue or a pure blue sort of uniform you can almost instantly tell yourself that they were somehow associated with the Prussians. And let me dive into that a little bit more. Something you might not know is during the American Revolution, the troops uh, were trained, at least George Washington's troops, they were not trained by George Washington. They were trained by Prussian generals. Um, basically, the war book, the training manual for the entire army that lasted until 1812, so it was in use for about 30 or so years, was written by Prussian generals. The whole reason that I believe we won the American Revolution is because Prussia intervened. And to look at that even further, what color were the American soldiers wearing during these different wars? They were wearing Prussian blue. And if you look into the history, our actual uniforms from the American Revolution, at least on the side that won on the American side, were provided to us by Prussia. So we are literally wearing Prussian blue uniforms when we fight for the United States. The history of the chemical makeup of Prussian blue is a convoluted one. We have its accidental discovery in 1706, followed by a period of almost 50 years where we don't really understand how we're making it. And then it took until the 1750s for scientists to basically propose that Prussian blue could be broken down to base elements to be reconstituted later. But from there, it took until the 1780s for the experiments on Prussian blue to figure out that it was consisting of a base salt and a base acid. The acid would later become known as Prussic acid. However, it took another almost 30 years for any scientist to successfully deduce the chemical formula of this Prussic acid and basically Prussian blue in general. So you have over 100 years from the time that we accidentally invented this color to the time that we actually figure out what it is made out of. Interestingly, prussic acid is known today as cyanide, and it stems this name of cyanide from the word cyan, which is old Greek for the color blue. So from Prussian blue comes prussic acid, 
and from prussic acid came experiments on cyanide and different advancements in science. Now I want to discuss the use of spectroscopes and the blue color spectrum that led to the discovery of one of the most important and I think old world elements that we have. That element is cesium. Cesium is a soft, malleable, silvery gold metal with the atomic number of 55 and a melting point of just over 83 degrees Fahrenheit. Cesium is the most electropositive element of all the elements and it only has one stable isotope, which is cesium-133. Cesium is considered to be a primordial element that has existed in our universe since the Big Bang, and cesium is also magnetic, and it also burns bright blue. Now, the International System of Units has their official definition of a second and a meter, described as measurements made using cesium. Cesium and its unstable isotopes has half-lives of over multiple millions of years, meaning that cesium and its degradation can be used to measure space and time. So the constants of our world, the things that are never changing, including a second and you know units of measurement like a meter, these are deduced using cesium. Now, look at the clock on your device you're watching this video on. It might be a cell phone, might be a computer, but either way, this is using an atomic clock. These atomic clocks are basically run on cesium. This element is the defining element for measurements within our universe, and it's used as the barometer, basically, to engage with everything around us. Besides that, cesium is the most malleable of the metals, and it is also the element that is present in nuclear fallout. So ever since we began nuclear testing, the result or, you know, what we get from the nuclear testing that's so dangerous, that's put into the atmosphere, that is an isotope of cesium. So this element is everywhere. From the beginning of time, it has existed as the most electropositive or willing to give off energy element of all the elements. It's magnetic and primordial, and the international system of units is using this cesium metal and its half-life, its definitions, its nature, is the same nature as that of the universe. Cesium can also be mixed with gold, and it creates pseudo-halogens, meaning cesium and gold mixed together can create an energy source. So this is why I'm discussing this because look at the old world buildings that we've talked about and we see a lot of them topped with gold and we wonder if this gold was conducive to energy production and I believe it was, but I believe it was being used in unison with some other different elements and one that I wanna propose is the possibility of cesium and gold being used to harness energy. Now, when they're mixed together, it says that they reduce themselves down to a simple salt and the production of charges, meaning at its very base level, when you mix the two, you just get a compound and energy. So it's a very interesting idea. Now they say cesium itself cannot be exposed to oxygen and it cannot be exposed to water or else there'll be an explosive reaction. But if you have it in an oil like argon or something of that nature, you can expose or you can view cesium in its everyday you know normal state so i just find cesium itself to be one of the most interesting elements that i never heard of it appears gold but when deduced and ignited turns to a prussian blue it was founded by viewing elements through a spectroscope only to be noticed by its unique blue resonance cyanide named for prussian blue has a deadly chemical makeup and has been used for countless atrocities throughout time. Cesium, which is also named after blue, continues that narrative by being the element that is released into the atmosphere after nuclear reactions and explosions. Cesium itself serving as a agent and the most electropositive of all the elements being magnetic and constant and used as a barometer for defining exactly what a second and a meter are in our world. 
as well as determining exactly where in space-time we are at. Cesium is measured in a frequency, and it can be combined with gold to create an amalgamate which produces positive energy. The exact nature of cesium and its possible uses is still being determined today. Prussian blue, on the other hand, itself is considered to be a cure for cesium poisoning. Prussian blue is also the namesake for the blueprint and for the extensive blue woodblock paintings that came from Japan. There are also numerous other inventions that would have been impossible or substantially harder without the creation of Prussian blue. So in conclusion, I can only show you the information which I found, and I will allow you to create the ties between these developments as you see fit. As it relates to art, science, and the human spirit, I believe the color of pure blue or Prussian blue is very important. I thank you for being here. If you stuck with me till the end, please hit the thumbs up. This was one of my most time consuming videos yet, but I really enjoyed making it. And I appreciate you being here. Everything you have to say, I do read and I love all you guys. So let's keep this community strong. Let's stay together and I'll see you on the next upload.